morning, everyone. My name is Maaret Sisajärvi, and I came here from, from Finland. And I have the, the privilege of sharing some of my lessons and stories and things that I have gone through at, at work. A lot of times I find that when I go to Agile conferences and I listen to so-called gurus, the people that I have read books from, like the, the morning's keynotes, I feel like a total imposter. I've been only doing Agile since 2001. Like, you know, I'm complete newbie to this. 2001 is a few years back. And, well, I've been around in the software industry for 25 years. But it still feels like it was yesterday when I, when I started. And a lot of the stuff, kind of like what I read in books, I get inspired by that. And I try very hard to apply that at work. I do stuff around continuous deployment, continuous delivery. I'm a huge fan of mob programming. That's absolutely one of the, the mo most biggest favorite things that I have. And I do things like what I talked about yesterday, things like having no product owner so that the team holds all of the power. So I do many things around Agile in, in the organization. But still, kind of the thing that I have, because I work as part of a team, usually my title is a lead quality engineer, but for the last about six months, I've held the title of a senior manager. So I'm managing a team of 12 developers, and we are delivering software together. I'm a manager with very hands-on role, so I still test with my team most of my time. I just have to do certain uh, procedures around uh, growing people and making sure we make notes of having had discussions about their career uh, path and, and growth. But a lot of this stuff kind of like, you know, working in the real, real projects uh, and, and particularly being stuck in one organization. I don't actually think of it as being stuck. I think of it more as in like choosing to be stuck, choosing to spend a, a relevant amount of time with a particular organization. Some of the things that I feel in that case is that uh, I can't do all of the things as the books say. I have to actually suffer through things that are, you know, I just hear things on the stages here that, that you know, other people say that they have gotten rid of it. But I actually have to, you know, do those things, and, and, and that's kind of one of the motivations of this talk here today, that I keep on striving for better. We keep on striving for better. We keep on trying to change things. But the change, sometimes it's costly, it takes money, but especially what I find is that it takes patience. It takes time, it takes continuous small changes, mentioning stuff that you would like to be different for multiple people, and just not giving up. Being persistent, being, you know, driven towards whatever change you're trying to drive in your organization. And again, I kind of tell these stories that I tell here from the position of my title was one of a QA uh, engineer. So that's not the highest title in the organization. And still I'm telling stories, usually, around uh, things where we could make a relevant change starting from something that I initiate as just someone working in the team. So I hope that's part of the, the story and inspiration that you can take home today. That I believe that, you know, all of us with persistence can, can do stuff like this. So we're going to talk about uh, an, an experience of moving uh, into continuous delivery. This is actually an experience that I have had in multiple organizations when I have changed jobs. I enter a place where we don't quite yet get it, and then I try to get us to move there and then kind of like, you know, take us through that route. And it seems to be a repeating pattern, and it's, it's a journey that, that is not always, well, never completely there. So when I talk about uh, continuous delivery, what I mean is that, that we have probably still somewhere in this overall pipeline a person involved. So it's not automatically from, from uh, checking something into the baseline that we get it all the way through. There's usually still, in my processes, there's, there's someone at some point doing some kind of uh, decision, at least, if nothing else. Nothing else, and, and, and we're still striving to get to the other CD, which is the continuous deployment part, where, where all of the decisions would be made as the, the code is, is being created. So that's, that's the world that we're talking about. So <clears throat> I work in a company called F-Secure. F-Secure does cybersecurity software, and my team in particular, it's a corporate endpoint team, and we do uh, Windows endpoint protection clients, 
which basically means, you know, simply said, antivirus, firewall, that type of things. So different mechanisms of keeping a personal computer uh, safe. And I joined this particular team and this particular company two and a half years ago. It's now my second time around in the same company. I also used to work there 12 years ago when that company was starting to implement Agile in the first place. And it's actually a really fascinating thing to kind of like, you know, going into a different organization or actually a couple of different organizations and then coming back home, so to speak, and, and looking at kind of like what has changed while you were gone and, and looking at some of the things where kind of you realize that you were some of the block, blocks of, of, of progress while you were there. So, so it was actually good that you were away, away for a while. But again, when I came back, I came back still at 2016 into an organization that told me that in the team that I joined, delivering frequently would be impossible. So we had usually, typically, uh, we would have smaller, we call them maintenance releases, about quarterly, and then a major release about two times a year. So every second one of the releases was a major one with some cool new features. And every second one was kind of like, you know, patching it. And, and, and we were very used to that, that rhythm of, of working. And as someone who works a lot with testing, I know how painful it is to be in that kind of project. The last weeks just before release are awful. And having been in better places, I know that that's not the life of a human being. If you can have a choice, you do not want to have that. But you would want to have this you know, steady pace of, of getting a good night's sleep and not having this you know, rushed feeling in the end, trying to get the right information together at the right time. It should be, you know, every day is the, the good time to get that information. And, and I knew from my pa past experience in other companies that had implemented things like continuous delivery that it was a complete game changer for, for testing uh, related stuff. So again, doing smaller things was, was a lot, lot easier. So I started having this discussion around like, well, why is it impossible? Like, I believe we could do it. And, and I got a couple of uh, answers that were kind of, of relevant and foundational. The first answer was that, well, the type of software we are doing, no one does continuous delivery on that type of software. So, you know, even Amazon, like they have whatever, 30,000 computers. You know, that's only 30,000. We have 5 million. We have to install in millions, basically. Like any time we deliver, we talk about millions of computers because we're talking about home PCs, not servers somewhere. So while the usual stories around continuous delivery that I could find were around this idea that, you know, your users in masses were somewhere and they were connecting to a service with some interface somewhere, the world that I was now joining again was a world where an individual computer could basically have whatever in it. If it was a, uh, a, a consumer's computer, you know, your home home computer, I can't prevent you from installing a VPN client there that maybe doesn't work together with our software. And I have no idea which VPN client you're going to be using. Same thing with other antivirus software, most networking applications, and a lot of the programming tools that we actually use conflict with antiviruses because there's so much file editing going on in the way that we work that depending on how your environment is set up, I just cannot have all of your computers at my work. I can't build that kind of env environment. So there's no Docker image that I can take out of all the millions of different kinds of computers that are completely under someone else's control. But of course, the situation that I came into, the team that I came into, is, is a little bit different. So I don't work with all of our products. We have a shared code base, but I don't work with all of our products. I work in particular with this one product which is oriented towards a service, security as a service. And that, uh, since it's for corporations, also means that uh, corporations have this habit of, of, you know, just at least a little bit uh, having a more similar environment within their, their companies so, so that their admins don't actually have to see the whole scale of, of variety. But the basic software that we're building, it's still uh, for essentially millions of different uh, computers. Whatever flavor of Windows, it used to still be Windows XP that was supported, all the different ones that have come out ever since. You could have any of them in your 
a computer. And that was the, the environment we were building for. So I started looking for others who had done th things like this. I wasn't actually able to find many, but I found many that had you know, done similar steps uh, uh, in some scale at least. So I was sure that, that there is nothing that would completely block it. So we just needed to kind of like invent and, and figure out what the, the practices here would look like. And the other thing here, what people would say is that, well, since this is a corporate thing, it's a, for businesses, no user, no company, no admin would allow us to deliver frequently. So again, all of you know the interruptions, like maybe you, you, know, you need a reboot. That's kind of a bad thing. Every time you deliver Windows software, you know from your own Windows machines, probably by heart, that it's super annoying that you have to be rebooting all the time. So we had all these you know, considerations of like, you know, we don't want to cause so much trouble. Like, what if we would do this you know, even once a week? Like, they would just remember us as the, the reboot uh, uh, engine that you know, makes everyone reboot regularly. So that's not really a, a, a perception that you, you want to have. And uh, the first uh, thing that we actually could uh, come up with uh, on this one is, is that in the recent years, we've actually been implementing a completely rebootless way of, of uh, introducing new updates to, to that. And it's not that special in that sense, but, but we were just so used to the idea that there would be a reboot here and there, and, 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 and there's nothing that we can do until we learn that, of course, there's something that you can do. It's, uh, the reboots are always caused by locked files, if you don't have a locked file, then you don't need a reboot. So if you figure out a way of going around that, it's just a technical problem, then, then it's all possible. And the third thing that everyone kept telling me on why this would never work is that, well, uh, to build a set of installers so that we could make a release, it took us five days, usually by uh, at least one person fully working on it, but usually by another person at least occasionally supporting. So it's probably like more like seven mandates that it, it was taking. And there were some aspects of testing in it. So, so not only the, the building, but some aspects of testing that needed to be done manually. But that was actually quite uh, little that needed to be done on that side. But the big part was, was all the different things on getting the right uh, uh, executables together into the right kind of package having them sign so that there's different people signing. There have to be actual people involved in that signing process. Because if we end up releasing software that somehow gets compromised and it's, you know, someone can fake being our software, that's kind of a secu uh, serious thing for a security company. We do not want that. So all of the signing mechanisms related to Windows, we had to, had to have uh, those in place. And that was a really, really uh, slow process. And even though we have made it a lot faster, it's still the process that makes us from, uh, keeps us from uh, uh, having continuously deploying things automatically, because there will always be that manual step. Uh, unless I co manage to complete my so far two year project of, of uh, trying to get the practicalities together so that we could have automatic signing and the proper trust relationships technical trust relationships in, in place. So the, the people stuff is, is now OK, but the technical implementation is still kind of on the way. But this was, was really the, the uh, case where, where I went. And a lot of the discussions that I needed to have were around kind of like, you know, funny that you should say that. It seems that you know, other people are able to do it. And even other people inside this company are able to do it. Like, why are we not looking around at all? So first of all, uh, uh, in an antivirus software, it's not just that it's one layer or one component. It's actually uh, a lot of components. It's 54 components that we are building within my team and the teams who build into that system. But also there's these what I call service components, uh, basically databases that need to actually be changing every single day, multiple times a day. Because otherwise, uh, if someone comes up with a new virus, we don't have a detection for it. We don't have a removal for it. We need to actually be moving just as fast as any of the bad guys in, in, in this, this area. So we had actually been doing this, this kind of you know, continuous delivery, uh, even continuous deployment on that area for quite many years. I didn't even realize that we were doing this already before uh, 
the whole continuous delivery, continuous deployment became a big thing because it was so kind of like, you know, separated from what I was doing on the higher levels of the product that I wasn't or many other people weren't paying uh, proper attention to it. We also, uh, during the, the first year of my return in F-Secure, we completed a long, long project that had been, been going on for quite some time, which was basically introducing a, a kind of, there's the, the in, there's the databases part, which is on the bottom, then there's an engine kind of framework somewhere in the middle, and then there's whatever I'm building uh, with my teams on the top. So the middle layer, they had decided at some point that they want to go versionless, basically, by, so that they don't have to care about which version it is there, so all the APIs need to be compatible to different directions and, you know, all the stuff that we, we talk around, how to make, make these fast deliveries uh, possible. So we were just about to do that and I was there for the first uh, year to complete a uh, delivery of the, the, the client that included the change into the versionless versionless uh, engine framework and it didn't really feel like we would get the full benefit out of it if we didn't really follow with the, the whole product into the same, same mindset. And also uh, we had figured out uh, with the, some of the newer technologies, I don't know how many generation of technologies we're right now in, it's still the same product, we've been building it for 30 years now, but it has completely been rewritten so many times that I, I think nothing of the original is, is there anymore. But in the current version, there's this possibility and, and, and we have figured out how to do rebootless upgrades, which was a big, big blocker. So having these kind of discussions and like, you know, we could actually do this. We maybe could, you know, try what if, you know, in some scale we would start doing this. Maybe we can figure it out. Maybe we can delay the actual decision and we can try it out first. Uh, that's how we, we kind of uh, uh, got together. And Really, why would the product-facing part be so different? It's not actually that different. So, again, as a security company, we realized that, you know, since we are working in defense against so-called bad guys, uh, we really cannot be moving uh, so slow. And different threats around uh, how people are trying to get on the computers and how we are even detecting if something bad is happening. They've been changing so much that we can't really wait three months to have a fix available. We need to somehow figure out on, on how to be just as fast as, as the other side, so to speak. So uh, we didn't really put together any project. It was just something where uh, in the development team that I worked in back then in the lead quality engineer role, uh, we talked, I talked in particular to my manager, and I got the manager convinced that he needs to put one goal into everyone's annual goals. And the one goal said, you need to be able to release in two hours. That was the one year's goal. And everyone was a little bit grumpy first at that, and like, oh, look, we get these insane goals, like it's, you know, so much work. Like if we start practicing this five days every time, we don't do anything other than releasing. And after the, uh, about the week of grumpiness, it's like, okay, fine, we have to do it. Let's just take care of it right now. And, you know, a few months later, it was almost like magical. When you got, when I got over the, the uh, or the team got over the idea of not wanting to do this, it didn't seem like it was such a big deal after all. It wasn't super expensive. It was just that we needed to be very, you know, structural and think through what are the, the phases in our releasing and, and have everyone, everyone in the team implement bits and pieces that would help the flow so that we would have test automation that we can easily run on different environments, different combinations, different products, and we would have all the different tools on, on building a package in a reliable way uh, out of the, the trunk. And it wasn't that uh, big of a thing, but we got to not two hours, but, but actually three hours uh, uh, in, in that, that time frame. Uh, another thing that is kind of good to understand around then these, uh, uh, what we were doing and what kind of things we were practicing is, is around uh, the way we're building things. So a lot of the practices, kind of the originating point even for us to do things is we think of as in like, uh, we're not doing XP, extreme programming, even though we're an agile house, the technical practices are not in that side, but our technical practices are more of ones like uh, an internal open source community. 
So all the code is, is available for everyone. Anyone in any role uh, has access to the code and can make pull requests. Pull requests are usually uh, out of a branch that lives less than, than a day. So it's a very short-lived time. Uh, there's a rule, uh, well, a rule of like a saying that I keep on quoting to people who uh, have trouble getting their, their things merged in is that, uh, you know, you should be the burden of the statue. When you do smaller things, you usually suffer less. So if you are staying uh, in, in a place, you usually get it by stuff by the, the passing birds. And that's really a lot of the, the experience in the, in the version control. But we're basically, uh, for the Windows clients, for the 54 components that we're building, we are sharing them with teams, well, teams in Helsinki. There are several teams in Helsinki. Uh, so mine is just one, mine is 12 people, uh, but there's other teams as well. Then we have uh, teams in St. Petersburg working on that. And uh, we also have an office in Poland. And now uh, this year we are moving also to have some of that development into the same code base from South Africa. So our practices have to scale to the idea that we don't get to meet everyone every single day. But uh, we're putting things into the same code base. And out of that code base, we are making a release, basically by taking out whatever is in the trunk right now and making it available for, for our clients. So my side is that the little uh, SaaS uh, for businesses thing, the orange one. And all the numbers are from, uh, only from that perspective. Uh, but uh, since every other direction into this, this kind of bubble that we have, is also committing code into the exact same code base. We need to have uh, common rules on, on how to do that. And basically, it is to never break the trunk, always have test automation, uh, unit testing, and, and the, the higher level test automation, and make sure that it stays blue, blue all the time. And I don't even consider that a release practice. That's just a way of how we work together so that we have any chances of, of knowing where, where we are in all of that. But I just checked that we had 42 people contributing lines of code into the, the code bases uh, last year for the components that my team is, is responsible for releasing. And one component had 19 contributors. So mostly we're actually being uh, quite successful with the idea that you know anyone from any team can go and make the necessary changes in whatever component. There's just a guardian available in the, in the other teams. So for us, this all meant that we needed to find a new way of delivering, a new way of delivering so that we would have uh, not just a cadence, like, you know, not every two weeks on a Friday we would make a release. We didn't want that. We wanted that whenever something valuable was av available, uh, something that the users could benefit from, or where we would want to see that it's, it's not risking the users. Uh, we would want to deliver that, uh, throttle the release a little bit so that we could see that, you know, the first computers, the telemetry shows that they are getting it nicely and then only open the, the channel completely so that all of the millions get updated. And uh, uh, the releases, when they were tiny, the testing effort, even the manual thinking testing effort around that is, is much more manageable than, than if you have this huge, huge thing that you need to work on. And we kind of focused all of our energies into making something valuable and uh, estimates is not something we consider valuable. And that's something we, uh, we uh, kind of got rid of as, as we were starting to, to do this faster releasing as well. So I find from my experience, having gone through this now with two different organizations where I have worked in, that this whole uh, getting to less than a week, preferably daily releases, it's a complete game changer. And sometimes when I have then discussions with people around, like why would I think of it as a game changer? We, you know, we're still testing, we're still developing, we're still uh, releasing, we're still managing, we're still doing the same things in, in many ways. There is nothing new in the world in the last 20, 20 years. I need to kind of go back and say, like, why do I then feel like I'm living in a whole different world right now than the world I lived in 25 years ago when I started in this industry? Like, if it's nothing new, why is it that it feels so different? 
So this whole continuous integration, continuous delivery, and, and the fast feedback cycle, it has clearly changed, at least my profession, the testing profession, completely. And talking to my, my fellow developers, I find that it has changed their life quite relevantly as well. So what I then try to kind of explain to people and try to figure out on how to kind of say this is I find that metaphors are maybe the best way that I can, I can try to approach it. I find that, you know, if you think of two things that look kind of the same, if you have a pool, you know, swimming pool, or you have a bathtub, you know, both of them are containers of water. Well, some, one of them has a little bit more water, but it's still water, you know, just like, you know, it's still testing, it's still developing. It's still water. Why are these different? And it's really easy sort of for us to see that, of course, a bathtub and a pool, they are a completely different thing. There are things you can do in a bathtub, and there are things you can do in a pool. So, I don't know, uh, looking at uh, the bathtub we have in the hotel yesterday, and my daughter here in the first row, uh, using that bathtub and, and drinking some soda in that, that bath, next to that bathtub and seeing all the, 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 the cans dispensed. I was thinking maybe she was having a party at the bathtub, but usually, normally, we would think of a, you know, a proper party to happen rather on a pool side than a bathtub side. So that's, that's really not a thing. We have things like lifeguards. We need lifeguards when we have multiple people in the same container of water. But we didn't need them when we had the bathtub and we were just using that as the container of water. Uh, so there are things you do in a bathtub and there are things you do in a pool. And, and they allow you to do very different things. And this is how the continuous releasing, the fast, uh, small slices of delivery changes our world. That it enables us to do things that weren't there before. So one of the materials that I really, really enjoy on kind of using as a frame of reference on where we are is, uh, uh, well, I have to read from here because I can't see from there, by Paul Hammond. Uh, so I'm definitely just a practitioner, and uh, these uh, kind of like great thinking pieces are really, really helpful in, in understanding kind of where we are going. So when I say that things change when the rapid... Uh, releasing starts to happen. Practices have to look different. We can do different kind of purposes. It gives us a very different environment. So you would branch differently. You would probably test differently. You can't test in the old uh, way anymore where you would have a release every three months. You can't test in that way when, when you're doing a release more frequently. Your architecture needs to change. Your releases cannot be scheduled and planned and kind of like, you know, taken uh, as, as a plan and, and uh, being made sit in a release train, which is a, a safe w version, but they're kind of, you know, organically flowing through the, the whole system. Probably also the practices around infrastructure and, and databases are going to be changing. So some of these words here are much more relevant for the, the web-based uh, services type of world that I don't live in. So I find that when I'm trying to kind of place us on that map, we're somewhere more on the right side, but in many ways we're somewhere in the, in the middle because we haven't yet figured out all the ways to get all the way to the right or how it would actually be different in, in this kind of a, a, an environment. But again, if we have this, we need to make a release right now. We take the trunk and in three hours it can be out. It's, it's, it's not a bad uh, a solution that we, we have in place. So, so it's definitely something, something kind of nice that we've done. So all of this kind of leads me to this idea that even within the same organization, we are not all same. So I mentioned 42 people. My team is, is 12 people. Not all the people in my team has actually committed anything last year because some of them identify still as, as testers who don't do automation. So they might not have, have any uh, uh, commits as such, but they're more like you know, preparations, participating in discussions, bringing in certain perspectives. So I find that uh, I really, really love to be in my team. I really enjoy it there. I, I like the fact that we can work without a product owner and, and we get to make decisions about the, the health of the product. 
Uh, we get to do all the operation stuff. We can look at the telemetry. We know more about our customers from you know, what they actually do than, than, than the theoretical part of what they say they would do. So I find that kind of like right now, my team, that's my good place. But I don't always get to just work uh, within that one corner. We sometimes having that common code base. Uh, I need to go and work with some of the other teams. And then I've given them these really loving nicknames. I call one of them a soul-sucking place, which basically means that they have very uh, by-the-book agile practices where they stand up every day and have discussions around things and very like team uh, inclusion in everything, sharing everything. Uh, almost feels like they talk about what they eat today, uh, that you, know, you need to share that in the team. And it's a, it's a little bit different place. And I feel like it's using a lot of my energy, not of the value that we want to deliver, but more on, on certain kind of like, you know, risk aversion practices. That's what I would call it. So risk aversion practices nowadays, they, they seem to be sucking my soul out. So that's why I, I call it, it with this, this name. And then we still have sometimes someone comes up with, oh, we need to build a new product completely. And uh, we set up a project and we give it a date. It's going to be out in September. That's when it, it needs to be out there. And we might not have even recruited the people to do that project when we say today that it's going to be out in September. And, and that's the style of projects or delivering that I call the insane asylum. And it is kind of targeted towards this idea that we would only release once in the end. So in my good place, uh, we release either daily or weekly. So uh, any day of the week could be that release day. But our idea is that we, since it is a relevant size of a package that we will be updating with the changes from the 42 teams, we still do not want to deliver that. Uh, uh, we're figuring out a way of still splitting it in smaller pieces, but we don't want to do that more than, than once a week. Once a week, but we want to be able to do it on any day of the week, not just on a particular day. Uh, then, with my soul-sucking place, we usually work uh, with two-week cadence. So the day when we are doing a release, like everyone knows that it is really well kind of scheduled. Like it's going to be every Thursday. So there's a planning, and then you know all of the moves towards what is releasing. And uh, there's this this kind of like uh, joy, boredom, 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 a little bit of joy, pain, 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 and uh, that kind of like a profile with the two weeks. So again, the pain isn't as high because it's only two weeks, but the pain, you can, you can feel the, the, the peak of pain there always. And in the insane asylum, I really wish these wouldn't anymore exist, but even with what I do, uh, I still live through this. In the end of the project, we're supposed to have it all available. And we are sometimes still struggling with having 20, 30 teams working in this project get them to the idea that we should at least for ourselves be delivering continuously, even if we didn't give it to the customers. You know, you don't have to share the link. That's fine. But uh, make it available. Don't keep it on your, your uh, development machine only or only in the, the CI uh, environment. The attitude to quality is often very different in these three places. Uh, the, in the good place, uh, we usually talk about like this, this kind of concept on like, I really care about production. What's going on in production? How can we make production a little bit better? And for example, right now, my team has less than 20 tickets in Jira. Uh, out of those millions of customers, we have only 20 tickets. Because when a new ticket comes in, we try to take care of it. Fix and forget. That's the basic idea. So we care about the production and how the feedback and, and, and things in production are a lot uh, in, in, in that, that type of a model. Uh, in the uh, middle ground place, where we still uh, work on an agile cadence, uh, it sometimes feels like we need to you know, get together and plan and move a little slowly and, and think of things. And let's make one more plan. And, and, and the, the kind of like you know, rapid whiteboarding isn't, and, and the production orientation isn't isn't quite as much, but it's kind of like risk aversion is, is a little bit more there. And in the insane asylum, when they're trying to get control over it, I find that the motto we use mostly in the organization is, I care about my feature up to production. And we need to repeat this a lot of times for every single developer, care about your feature all the way to production. But it's not enough. You need to care about the feature beyond 
well, in production, actually. That's, that's where you go into. So these are easy to see when, when there's so many different kinds of, of projects. The way we deliver uh, in the good place is that we start together, we finish together, and it's a very organic, discussion-oriented way of doing things. You, know? you go on a whiteboard when you want to have a discussion. You, you call and do a, a remote whiteboarding session if you want to have a remote discussion. And uh, uh, when uh, you are about to be done, you're never delivering anything all by yourself. You're never alone. So there's always the safety net of, of other team members. So you can pull whoever you want and, and make sure you know, everyone is always available for others. But there's no strict process saying that you know, this person is approving your work. It's just you need a second person because we don't want you to be alone. The soul sucking place does a bit of this Jira roulette, like who gets which ticket. So it's in this state these people take it. I really think that Jira stuff is, is uh, one of the things that mostly suck out my soul. And the insane asylum is uh, anything that you can think of, you create a new ticket in Jira. And then someone is trying to make sense out of those tickets on how they are, like, you know, how many of there are, like, is there any progress and where we are. And then at some point of the project, when someone is worried about the schedule, then comes the, uh, the managers group, usually the high-level managers, who force everyone to sit hours and hours in the meetings, uh, scheduling all the tickets so that we know if we're going to make any schedule or what the schedule is going to look like. And I just look at that kind of like, like, why are we still doing this? Like, we have managed to not do this in so many projects. Why, why some still end up, end up like this? So it's a long path for us to grow in, in our organizations. Maintenance, also very different in the good place. It's a fix and forget. And when things go wrong, things break in production. Like, you can revert it, but a lot of times it's actually faster to fail forward. So uh, you can stop uh, the... In, in my world, I can stop the, the impact being any wider, but I often cannot revert an individual person's computer. But I can make sure you know, all of their hundreds of colleagues or thousands of colleagues don't get to experience the same problem that the first one saw. So failing forward and fixing that one computer and fixing the overall deliverable is, is much more of the, the way. In the soul-sucking place, uh, usually we spend so much time with estimates that we don't have to uh, deliver as much. And in the insane in asylum, asylum, it is really building these maintenance projects that are about half of the, the effort that we, we generally use. So there's always the cycle of new features and then maintenance, new features and maintenance. So going through that cycle. And we're so used to it that sometimes it's hard to avoid it. Uncertainty in the good place. You know, I feel quite tolerant with the level of uncertainty. I get the, the colleagues together and we have discussions. Even when I'm here, I can have a discussion online with them. Uh, also, well, I'm lucky enough to be here and not having to be there at the same time. That's part of the way we are trying to work so that there's no dependency on an individual person. I kind of enjoy being at conferences. The soul-sucking place, well, uncertainty is managed, but uh, sometimes I say that we use about 70% of our time into the uncertainty and 30% only into the value. So there can be a lot of, of practices around that. And in the insane asylum, it feels like you put a gun to your head and, and there's one bullet out of six. And that's how you kind of like deal with it. Like you just have to take whatever comes because the risk is so large that, that it's hard to manage anymore. So you haven't split it up. So all these different places, different projects, you know, none of them are hopeless. They're just uh, on a different place in the path. And we need to keep telling the stories within our organizations to get us, get the other teams, get everyone onto the path of having the, the lesser pain. The practices do change, the development practices, the testing practices, product management and management practices. Jeff talked about all of these different categories, actually, in the morning keynote. And it feels really like you're in a completely different place. So the good place is one where you somehow end up with a reputation of flow. Like, you know, things just go through your team, so no one even asks you of schedule. You know, they tell you of, of things of importance, and you will say, like, oh, I acknowledge this is important. They just assume it comes out. They don't ask how long it's going to take you. They know that you will do it as, as quickly, you know, in small pieces as possible. And that's what I get to experience. So it's, it's a completely different relationship with the business people when they don't you know, ask you on how much is this going to cost us, us first. 
And they don't really care about that answer. That's only for them to say that they can't yet trust your delivery ability. So they don't want to pay for the estimate. It's, it's a, a comforter for them. Uh, there's a lot more effort uh, available to put into the impact and the value that goes out of the whatever engine we have that is, is delivering this, and less into the all kinds of padding, risky, uh, 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 oriented management practices and, and change control boards. And there's things where you realize, you know, you put a list of, of things you're doing, where it's, you know, time to take care of this right now, fix and forget. And then there's things where, you know, time takes care of them. Like some of the things just aren't as important as others. And you start seeing these patterns a lot more when you have the continuous feedback cycle on, on what is pressing in the production right now. What would be the thing that you would look at right now? The code base is your ultimate truth instead of all of the documentation that you try to wishfully think that, that you would have. So that's a nice thing. And testing really kind of flows together with all the rest of the team. So it's a very nice and collaborative and close relationship. It's not only automation, but it is only the, you know, thinking through all the things that might break because of this, that, that we're doing, doing together. And finally, when you have this continuous feedback loop, it is like uh, you listen to that feedback and you get a little bit better. If you keep on being the same, you're same in a year. But if you're a little bit better, 1% better every single day, in a year you're actually 38 times better than you are right now. So learning, listening to feedback, that is absolutely the winning, winning way of, of working. So we talked about this idea that a bathtub and a pool are two different things. They're both containers of water, but they serve completely different purposes. And in the sense of continuous uh, delivery and continuous deployment, uh, delivering all the time, it enables you completely different practices. Thank you. I think we have time for a question still. Anyone feel like asking a question? There's a couple on that side. I can repeat the question if I can hear it to hear. So you had as well, okay. I can hear you and I can repeat your yeah. question. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. Actually, just wanted to understand, like you just mentioned that in your team there is no PO. Yes. Right? So I just wanted to understand how the user stories are coming in and if there is a change or manipulation in the user story, how as a team you are taking care of all those activities. So can you brief me something in that so sense? The question is, since we have no PO, how does that work? I spent 45 minutes explaining that yesterday. So there will be a video with a long, long version of, of that answer. But uh, it's really the same way as business people would get those. You know, they, they fish them around and they put them in some kind of a list. They have some idea of what's most important. We do that, but we also know the technology uh, impacts of whatever we, we decide on, on doing that. So it's, it's very similar. It's just that the belief system is that uh, uh, serving the customers right is the most important thing that we should do. And uh, the most important thing should not be left for one brain. It should be every brain's problem. So that's basically the, the summary of, of the NOPO. Also, I have one more question, mm -hmm. like it's related to continuous delivery. So like uh, you just explained how, how you have you implemented the continuous delivery in your team. So for example, if I want to implement the same thing which you are implementing in your team and how to make sure like nothing is breaking when it is going into production, like we should take how care of test automation or continuous testing, how you're making sure of all these activities. So uh, this is again, I find it difficult to answer some of these. So having test automation is a, is a good thing. My first uh, project in my before, before this company, when I went to continuous delivery, we did it completely without test automation. So there are other practices that you could apply as well. So I think we should have a longer discussion about this after the, the talk. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, Ah, oh, that way. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, you you spoke about uh, variable frequency time boxing. Yes. But will, will that not break the cadence if there are multiple applications? 
you know, going going into pr release at uh, the same time. Yeah, so if there are variable frequency time boxes, uh, time boxes. Uh, so it's again, what I mean by that is, it's like if we want to do one release on this week, uh, it might be any day of the week, instead of having a particular day when you're scheduling doing a release. And I do work still towards figuring out ways of changing the product so that this could happen different times of the day, so that whenever it is ready, it is not, you know, you could deliver that application right away. Uh, my question is, uh, as you went through this transformation journey, what was your project management strategy like? Project management strategy. Yeah, because how do you convince those people who are with this 1980s mindset to accept this? And what are the new matrices that you came up with instead of the old ones? I'm not sure if I have an easy answer for that. So uh, we usually don't have project managers for most of the things. Like we are very team oriented and the teams kind of work in a network manner. So, so that's, that's kind of, we've organized this, this like a, a network way of, of, of co-managing whatever we are delivering. But um, yeah, the lean practices are very heavily there, definitely in, in many of the things. We can have a longer discussion about this so that I can understand the question better. So, yeah. thank you. So, thanks everyone. I think uh, it's it's time to take a break, and I'm going to be around all day today. So, I would be happy to have more discussions on any of the topics that you know pique your interest. Thanks.